In this episode, we'll be talking about what it means to be a chief design officer. We'll be talking about design as activism and finally, cities that are driven by citizens. And here is the guest of this episode. Hi, I'm Anne and this is the Service Design Show. Hi all, my name is Mark Fultijn and welcome to the Service Design Show. If you want to create more impact and change the world for the better as a service designer, then you've come to the right place. Because on this show, you get the chance to learn from the success of some of the world's best service designers. We cover topics ranging from design thinking and customer experience to organizational change and creative leadership. If these are the topics you're interested in, be sure to know that we bring a brand new episode every two weeks on Thursday. So if you haven't done it already, click that subscribe button. My guest in this episode is Anne Stenros. Anne is the Chief Design Officer for the city of Helsinki and she's been a creative catalyst basically for her whole career. In the next 25 minutes or so, Anne will be talking about three topics. What does it mean to be a Chief Design Officer? What if design was activism? And finally, what if cities would be run by citizens? If you prefer to listen to a podcast version of this episode, head over to servicedesignshow.com slash podcast but remember, here on YouTube, you'll find content that isn't posted as a podcast. That was it for this introduction. And now let's jump straight into the interview with Anne. Welcome to the show, Anne. Thank you. <laughs> Very happy to have the first chief design officer, I think, in the, the uh, 36 or 37 episodes we did. So uh, very happy to have you here. My first question that I ask all the guests on the show is, do you remember when you first got in touch with service design or maybe in your role with design in general? So how did you end up here? Well, um, sorry to say, but I, I was born with design in my blood. <laughs> <laughs> my mom, she's a very famous Finnish uh, furniture designer and my father is an um, architect. So. I was born and raised around design, mm. and design. Mm. so um, I couldn't escape that. Uh, you were lucky in that sense. Yeah. And, and um, uh, we're on the service design show, do you? Is there a moment that you can remember that you heard about service design specifically? I think it was uh, several years ago when I was still at Kone <laughs> um, as a design director there. And uh, then I heard the first uh, time about service design. Mm. And because uh, service was um, at that time half of the business of uh, Kone, wow. namely the business of elevator and escalator. So it was very natural to get interested in that. So, so even for a company that produces uh, elevators and uh, escalators, 50% of their business was services. Yeah, and I think today it's 60 or even more because it's growing very fast. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And as with um, all the episodes we've done so far, we're doing the co-creation format with the questions and you've sent me a few topics that are on your mind and I've sent you a few question starters and we'll just co-create the questions for the next 20, 25 minutes. Are you ready? Okay, yes. <laughs> Should be, please. <laughs> there we go. And uh, we start with the question or the topic that I find interesting. And this is the chief design officer. Do we have a question starter that goes along with this one? All right. Uh, my question is uh, why? So why did you have a chief design officer? And um, I think it's an in interesting opening that the city of Helsinki, um, have, uh, that they created this job, actually. First in the world, probably, I think. At least there are not too many colleagues <laughs> in this game. Sorry to say, and mm. I welcome everyone who, mm. who will join the, the crowd, the more the merrier. But why is the question that, uh, why the city itself, that they see that they need something like a chief design officer? Now, a few um, months ago, I read uh, from uh, internet, I think it was uh, Steve Bosniak who said that Every company will need in the future chief disruption officer. Mm. And I thought that this is exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm 
trying to do a disruptive innovation within the organization. Hmm. And I think that's exactly what could be the benefit of hmm. the designer to join a city organization. So could you, could you take us back to the moment where somebody in the city of Helsinki thought, well, you know what we need? We need a chief design officer. How, what was that process? Well, It's a long, a long journey because at 2000, Helsinki was the EU capital of culture. And then the design was uh, very much um, on the focus of all the cultural activities. And after that, Helsinki got this work design capital uh, nomination. And I think that was 2012. Mm -hmm. And after that, they started to think about naturally what is the next step mm -hmm. on that lane. And uh, then they decided that they will need a chief design officer. But probably it was me, myself, who actually <laughs> sold the idea for them without knowing that this will be my destiny. <laughs> Because uh, uh, three years ago, I, I was uh, talking a lot publicly about the emerging tendency that the companies, they are hiring chief design officers and what could be the benefit out of that. Hmm. So they listened to me very carefully hmm. uh, years ago. And um, I'm really interested in how is, the, uh, how is the chief design officer structured within, um, w within the city? So do you have a team or a department or is everybody a designer? How, how does it work? Well, um, I have been only one year in this position now, or in this role, and it's still a work in progress, because within two years' time, I should figure out what is the proper role <laughs> for a chief design officer, and also uh, what would be the proper place for that in the organization. Yeah. There has been a very strong structural uh, transformation within the Helsinki City organization, So that's why this is now uh, only a project. Mm. But as I said, that my, one or part of my job is to find out what is the proper place for that. Mm. At the moment, I'm uh, sitting in the strategic department, and I think it's quite a good uh, place because um, I can influence uh, really the, all the strategic issues that the city is dealing with. Mm. So it's very high in the hierarchy. And could you give an example of a, a challenge or a project that you are involved with? Uh, last year, the, um, the city of Helsinki was planning the next four-year strategy plan. And I participated in that with a special project, an independent project, and namely Scenario uh, Planning. So we did four scenarios for Helsinki. And based on those, we ran um, over 10 workshops among the 250 city leaders. Mm. And we co-created co the vision for the coming um, strategy. And I think it was the first time that people really felt engaged to the future. Mm. <laughs> uh, uh, because they were very happy about the discussions that we had. Because it was mostly a strategic discussion, value-based discussion and also a future-orientated discussion. Hmm. What, what, you, you've been doing this for a year, you said. What is, the, what is your biggest lesson from the last 12 months? What have you learned? Well, people many times they ask me uh, what's the biggest difference, uh, difference comparing my previous life in business. And I think that um, if I think now, uh, I think that people are the same. You know, you will find good people in any organization that help help you to, to accomplish what you want to do and vice versa too. Uh, but I think that the clock speed is completely different mm, mm, mm. in business and mm. in, in a public organization. That's for sure one, one thing. Uh, business is uh, faster. By all means, it's much more faster. And there is always this kind of sense of urgency. It's very complicated to create this uh, sense of urgency for change in a um, city organization. Or at least it's, it's uh, far more difficult. Mm. And then on the other hand, in business, uh, it's usually very focused. 
So you deep dive into one uh, business area and uh, you have a lot of knowledge, in-depth knowledge. But in the scale of city, when I'm dealing with strategic issues, there is everything from <laughs> babies to grandpas. Yeah. So <laughs> it's yeah. very complex. It's very wide. It's more like horizontal thinking than vertical thinking. So you're... you're you have to have a lot of patience when, when being a chief design officer at a city. Yeah, <laughs> and I think that's not my strength. Really. <laughs> so I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, always trying to remind myself that keep, uh, keep going baby steps only. I mm. Mm. Where, where, uh, where do you hope to leave the city of Helsinki with, with three or five years? What do you hope the chief design officer well of course i can't do it by myself exactly as yeah I said. it's um, it's uh, 40,000 people working for the city of mm. 600,000 citizens but what i i love to do is actually to to get this uh, development in the future more citizen driven mm. that's my dream get people involved get citizens involved and open up the organization so that there is um, an authentic dialogue with citizens, mm. whatever the issue could be. I, I guess that's quite scary for the, for government organizations. Well, I think that Helsinki has taken already steps towards mm. I think it's more on the side of citizens that easily you can get elderly people, retired people to participate into the discussion, you know, in, in local events, etc. But where are all the young people mm. worried about? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Or people with families, little children. They mm. don't have too much time for that. So probably we need different tools for different generations mm. or different groups of people. Mm. Let's, let's, let's move on to the second topic, otherwise the time will be over before, uh, before we're done. And I, and I think this, this one uh, also relates to what you're already talking about. And the second topic is called design as activism. Do you have a question starter? That's my favorite. <laughs> I show you. How can we? <laughs> how can we? Very well to that, probably. So the question would be, how can we use design as an activism? Yeah, I think that um, as we all have noticed that we are living in strange times. Everything is uh, under uh, constant change and um, not even under constant change but un under constant transformation. There is so much going on in the world now and when I participated in one of these uh, service experience camps last year, that was in Berlin, I was invited as a keynote there. So um, one of the young service designers um, actually explained me. <laughs> he said that service design is always a political act. Interesting. Uh, and that was quite, uh, quite strange um, for a person of my uh, generation. Because I still remember my, um, my early years um, at the university as a freshman in architecture and nobody was talking about uh, politics. And ever since, I mean, not any creative people in my uh, mm. round, they, have, uh, uh, they, haven't, they really have not discussed about politics or even mentioned it. And then in the same event, one service designer, he said to me uh, in, the, in the dinner that I'm going to politics next year. And I thought, oh my goodness, how <laughs> you really are. Maybe it was just by coincidence. But I think that these young service designers, that um, they, they feel that they, they want to do something. It's not enough that they complain about the mm. things, they plan things. But they really want to act. They want to do something. And I think this is very, very refreshing in my mind. Of course, I rather see that they do things for good <laughs> than for bad. But, but basically, I think that since Viktor Papanek's time, we haven't really discussed about this kind of design activism uh, in, in, uh, in uh, our discipline. 
And I think it's very healthy to understand that really whatever you do related to design or service design, but basically in design, you are touching the people's lives. Mm. And that's why it is a political act. And in that sense, it's an, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a po political act. Yeah. Uh, what should be, uh, should we be adapting design education to uh, address this more or make people, make future designers more aware of this or should we just let it go and develop naturally? Well, I'm basically, I'm very non-political person because I'm interested in more, <laughs> more uh, maybe the other issues, but, but I think that it, it should be very healthy at least to have this discussion with young designers mm. because they will face this when they go to the work life. And the other thing is here that we, we really should uh, address whatever we do, the grand challenges, because if we think about urbanization, for example, and all the environmental issues. So I think that there are so severe and complex issues that we, we really need all the smart minds and all the creative people to join the forces to solve them. And that's why I think it's, it's important that we have this value discussion. What are the values that we stand for? And um, I participated uh, just recently um, an EU forum, uh, namely uh, Responsible Research and Innovation Workshop. And I was so surprised when quite many people there were talking about our planetary boundaries mm. and also that uh, the planet should be as a defining framework what, what kind of research or innovation we are actually doing. And I'm more and more towards this kind of thinking that uh, do we really dare to touch the, uh, the universe mm, in, mm. in that respect? Mm. So I think that uh, we are facing, as I said, these big challenges. And somehow we, we have to make up our minds. Are we going to sell them or mm. are we just leaving them mm, mm. to happen there? So that's why I think that this kind of design as a tool for activism could be um, one of uh, the approaches mm. for those challenges. And what inspires you the most uh, regarding these topics? Do you see any good examples yeah, that, that, that give you hope? <laughs> um, well, I think that um, usually when you discuss with uh, young designers, they are very aware of the issues, mm -hmm. but somehow I can't see that much this kind of enthusiasm to, to face the, the challenges among the more seasoned designers. Why is you know, that? They are boiled in businesses mm. <laughs> and they, they, have, uh, they have so, uh, so many other focus areas. But I think that I really do hope that, that we keep keep this discussion alive mm. so that we also involve more and more people into this discussion. And my worry is also that when we have these uh, conferences, seminars, workshops, it's always about, uh, you know, two old people in my mind. <laughs> Who attend? Or, yeah. Perspective. I mean that we need more young people there to challenge also our thinking, questioning our status quo, mm -hmm. what is a design. Mm -hmm. Uh, every single time that I, I get an invitation um, to those forums where there are young people, I uh, come back home with new fresh ideas, inspired. So I need that energy to, to sort of challenge also my ideas, because then I have to look at the mirror and face sort of the next generation right. and the future in a very concrete way. Well, important well, as a professional. As in, in that sense, as designers, we always have to be aware that we are probably designing for a different generation than ourselves in a lot of cases. Yeah. Mm. And also, like a very famous scientist, uh, Nobel laureate uh, Richard Feynman once said that the doubt is essential. Mm. We never know for sure. So there's always room for doubt. So I'm not a person to tell what is the best thing or what is the right thing. 
I have always my doubts. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's important that you keep yourself, your mind open to that doubt. Mm -hmm. Because then you keep possibility for the future also. And, and, and I guess we've built uh, a culture in, in a lot of uh, areas around the world that evolve around experts. Uh, and experts don't doubt. Yeah, well, well it, it's good to see, that, uh, to see that changing. I want to move uh, toward the third topic. And uh, it has to do with, uh, <clears throat> with the first one, I guess, maybe even the second one. And this one, the third topic is called the next city or citizen. Okay, and I ask, what if? Could you explain, what if? What if the next city is uh, completely, um, you know, uh, run by citizens? Mm. Completely controlled by citizens? What is the role of the city organization after that? I think it's a very appropriate question because we are going more and more towards this um, open governance, mm -hmm. meaning that uh, people are involved into the decision making and uh, into the dialogue and discussion. And I think that if, if we go um, very far to that direction, it means that uh, we are talking about civic city. So that the citizens are really the essence of the city itself. Okay. And uh, lately I have been thinking about when we talk so much about the smart city. Well, everybody is talking about smart city and smart city here and smart city there. But I read a very nice article. Uh, somebody said that I'm so bored of smart city. Give us something next. Okay. And then he proposed the idea of responsive city. And uh, this means that uh, it, uh, the whole focus of the city is on citizens, namely. So the data, it's based on the data of citizens and in, in, it's based on the interaction of the citizens. And by doing so, eventually the citizens, they have the control, not the city has the control over the city. Well, uh, I guess uh, in essence, it's, it should be the same at this moment, right? We've just uh, diverted it to a smaller group of people to make the decisions. But citizens don't feel as uh, well represented by the local government as they should. Yeah, but I think if, if we look at the, um, what is happening in uh, artificial intelligence, for example, so how long we need a voting system? Mm. Or is the artificial intelligence reading based on all the data, basically, uh, who is voting at <laughs> home? See what I mean? Yeah. That um, somehow I think that uh, we are living uh, now the times that most of the old protocols or old uh, processes or approaches that they are becoming obsolete, but we don't know what is the real next. But somehow we have to prepare our mind towards the next. And that's why it was so in, uh, important to, to create these scenarios for Helsinki and, and have the uh, mm. real discussion among the city officials. Mm. What is the next something? So that they prepare themselves. So probably a lot of these scenarios uh, at this moment look like science fiction, right? They are so far away that this could... Or are they... They are not that far away. Okay, yeah, well... But the whole framework was based on the uh, idea that, uh, that it's around the citizen experience and this civic city. So how much people uh, are willing to participate actively uh, into the issues of the city and what are the barriers, uh, probably, that we have to break down. And um, we, have, we also have to understand that not all citizen, citizens uh, are that active. Yeah. Probably there are some who are more active and some who are not that active. But we also have to support different uh, lifestyles mm. well, in that respect. And respect the different lifestyles. 
th that seems like a like a design challenge that is so complex. I wouldn't know where to start. What 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 do you see as a first step to, towards that civic city? Well, um, I think that the first thing is to to start this dialogue discussion really with citizens, and we have done great progress um, at the city of Helsinki. We have a, a local platforms to have the discussion. We have the city level uh, platforms and um, we are uh, setting up more and more labs and have mm -hmm. hubs that are also uh, lab platforms for this discussion with uh, small and medium and uh, medium sized and startup businesses. So I think it's it's important that you have different platforms. And then, of course, there has to be transpa uh, transparency and openness in the action. Hmm. And what, what does that... So you, you have to communicate a lot what you do as a city? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. And I think that uh, nobody has really good tools for that, but hopefully in the future we have better tools. We are hmm. working. What, what, what has surprised you the most within... This, this journey towards this civic city so far? Um, I think that uh, this uh, passion that is coming from people, mm. this bottom-up passion, that if you just give, you know, a little bit freedom, you know, all kind of uh, flowers are blooming. Mm. I don't know where it comes from, but especially here in Finland, also we have a long, dark winter time, but there are already very good examples that it gives a little bit freedom and possibilities for people, and they start to build upon on that. Mm. And I think this is the best thing uh, that that you can do, that uh, you are enabling people to to build their dreams rather than you are pushing your own dreams mm. as a designer for them. Mm. So I think there is a, there is a big difference, and... Uh, in that respect, um, I, I try, to, try to sort of understand what could be the first baby steps for this direction, mm. that there is this real, uh, authentic voice of people, citizens, rather than, you know, me telling them <laughs> what is best for them, and then they say, yes, yes. It, it's not, nothing like that. Mm. Interesting. I'll, I'll make sure to interview in uh, three or four years and see how far you've come with these baby steps. Don't wait that long. I think that after a year I will be more mature in this. All right. Mm. Hopefully. I promise. Mm, that's a good challenge. I'll, 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 uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be back in a year. <laughs> I, I also promised you that you'll, you would get a chance to ask a question for the people who are listening to this episode or watching it online. Is there a, a, something you'd like to ask them? Well, yes, this question for the audience. Um, um, I would uh, ask that, um, what is your purpose as a service designer? Uh, what is your passion for? So what is your what is your purpose and, as, and passion as a service designer? Yeah, as a service designer. I think it's, a, it's today a key question, especially when I said that we are facing these grand challenges. Mm. The only way that how you can survive professionally, <laughs> in my mind, is that you have to have a kind of passion behind whatever you do. So that means that you have a sort of certain uh, purpose. Mm perspective what you where you are heading it if you know don't if you can't name it but at least you have the direction <laughs> oh so i'm asking for what is your direction what is your direction leave the comments on uh, in the on the video and on the podcast really curious what people will answer so and <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Uh, it was interesting to hear, and I will get back to you in a year time, see how far you've come. So, again, thanks for sharing your, your, your thoughts and ideas. It was my pleasure. Thank <laughs> you. And now we're going to wrap up this episode. So what is your biggest takeaway from this episode? Share your thoughts and ideas down below in the comments. If you'd like to learn more, check out some of the past episodes or head over to learn.servicedesignshow.com where you'll find courses by leading service design experts that dig deeper into the topics we discuss here on the show. 
I'll see you in two weeks time with a brand new episode. Thanks for watching and see you then.